Everybody hear me? Okay, so uh, I'm Christine, and today I'm going to be talking to you about my master's thesis research, which is looking at the ecological and evolutionary dynamics of aquatic insects crossing uh, loaded glenching boundaries in the lake space in Sierra Nevada, California. So aquatic ecologists have classified uh, lakes and streams into two fundamentally different ecosystems. And while high mountain, uh, high mountain streams and oligotrophic mountain lakes have a lot in common, you still wouldn't expect them to have the same species. Um, Do things like flow, substrate, water temperature, etc. So I did a quick bibli uh, bibliographic search uh, for studies that look into lakes and streams. And so on the yeah, on the x-axis you have Google Scholar keyword search, and y-axis is number of results. And the first bar shows you number of studies that mention streams but don't mention lakes. Second bar represents the number of studies that mention lakes and don't represent uh, don't mention streams. And this unfortunately excludes that one scientist whose last name is Lake, but he studies streams. Um, <laughs> there are significantly fewer that study lake and streams, and even fewer that are looking at lake and stream interactions for invertebrates when they're not considered fish food. So that brings me to my questions of, do the same species inhabit both lakes and streams? And do the habitats cause differences in heritable or non-heritable characteristics? So my study site was located in California, uh, primarily uh, in Sierra Nevada, and primarily at Lakes Basin. But I also took some um, information for context from sites like Tamarack Lake, Cottonwood, and Spotted Fawn. Zooming into the Lakes Basin sites, you have here um, the Silver, Little Bear, and Big Bear Lakes. And those are all part of one watershed, the Feather River watershed. And then uh, you have the salmon lakes over here, which are a part of the Yuba River watershed. And then I also sampled the Goose Lake. So the blue represents lakes, and the orange represents the stream sampling. And sampling occurred in the summer of 2017, and that was a very wet year, as we've talked about today. Uh, so there were some differences in my sites throughout the summer. So here you have a picture of in June, there was during peak snowmelt when I uh, happened to go out there, and then I went a month later, and in July, this photo was taken from the exact same spot. So there was some variation that summer. I did timed benthic macroinvertebrate sampling on substrates like cobble, bedrock, and boulder, and I uh, did it five meter by meter quadrats, collected the individuals, uh, and put them in ethanol, brought them back to the lab, where I then did DNA barcoding, focusing on the mitochondrial DNA CO1 gene, uh, which is good for, because it's a slow evolving gene, it's good to tell a species apart. Then I looked at body and case morphology and followed that up with uh, looking at their diet through stabilized uh, dietary analysis. So we did find some aquatic insects that are in both lake and stream habitats. First up, we have the Eubryonic Tiburtii, which is a water penny beetle and Heteroplectra californicum, which is a caddisfly. And both of these are primarily stream-dwelling insects, but we found them in five of the six lakes, lakes, and lakes. And lastly, we have Limnophilus externus, which is another caddisfly, primarily a lake-dwelling caddisfly, and we found them in four of the six streams. Now, on site, it was easy to tell these caddisflies apart just because caddisflies make cases for themselves for protection. You can see that right here. And so their cases are unique to the species and easy to tell apart. Um, the caddisflies were more abundant in lakes. And while uh, there was a higher abundance of the water penny beetle in streams, they actually were more frequently found in lakes, which was interesting. So that brings me to my next question. Yes, they're in both habitats. But what are the ecological differences that are affecting um, the insects that are living in both lakes and streams? And so to do this, I looked at their abundance, life cycle phenology, morphology, and phoretic associations. And foracy is just when there's an association between two organisms where one is traveling on the body of another one without necessarily being a parasite or causing anything negative going on. Um, I also looked at diet and uh, genetics using mitochondrial DNA which uh, had some interesting results. 
uh, regarding the trophic structure and population genetic structure, but for today I'll just talk about morphology and different associations. So for morphology, focusing first on Limnophilus externus, the, one of the cast flies, just doing um, a, by sight, it's very difficult to measure cast fly gills. Um, but these are the gills on the abdomen of the cast fly, and I noticed that there were um, tended to be thicker abdominal gills on the lake individuals. About 78% of them had what was considered thick gills, and the streams had um, fewer that had thick gills. Uh, and for Eubryonic suborzii, the water penny beetle. I was looking at morphology, uh, and I noticed differences in the, their body shape and also their gills. So here you can see that this individual is more has an oval shape, and other individuals had more of a teardrop shape. And so I was kind of wondering if there was a lake and stream difference there, and I didn't find one. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's, there isn't something interesting going on there. So there's no significant differences in, in those two. Um, but next, I looked at the case morphology of Limnophilus externus, that third cast fly I've mentioned, and I found that the case length for fifths in star larvae was actually greater in the lakes, in the lake individuals, than those in the streams, and that was actually significant. So just for this one species of insect, they do have a lot of variation in their cases, but this is common in lakes and streams. Um, so the variation in case um, material and how it's sort of put together um, is in both habitats, but still the lakes had um, greater lakes in their cases. And um, lastly, today I'll talk to you about the associations on uh, with Limnophilus externus, that third caddis fly. Uh, so when I was looking at these caddis flies under the microscope, I noticed that there was a mixture of different kind of, I call them microinvertebrates in relation to the caddis fly, uh, because there were chironomids, uh, hydra, mites, sort of buried into the case when I was looking at them. And uh, I tried to quantitate, uh, get, get a number for that, and I found that about 45% of both lake and stream individuals had chironomid midges in their cases. There's no difference there. Um, but I did find that there was a difference in, some, uh, in the water mites. So when I pulled the caddis flies out of their cases, I found that some of them also had water mites that were all on the abdomen of the caddis fly. So here you have Limnophilus externus, a healthy looking individual, um, and here is one that was considered maybe less healthy or looked a little bit more sickly. The gills didn't look as great, there was some spotting, and they had uh, mites on their abdomen. And I found that 33% of the lake individuals had mites on their abdomen, and none from the stream did. Um, and upon further inspection, we kind of have a tentative ID that uh, the water mites that were on the cases, like these ones, been um, identified as adult or bad water mites, um, which are known to feed on things like detritus and algae, so I suspect that it's probably a phoretic association, not causing harm to the cat's fly. Um, however, the ones that were on the abdomen are larval hygrobatoid water mites, which are known to engage in a pre-parasitic attendance, so they tend to hang around the cat's fly, waiting for it to be closer to pupation before they attack. So um, I'm not sure if it's officially a negative um, relationship, but that's, that's interesting. Um, and to conclude, uh, so I did find that the same species of aquatic insects can be present in both lake and stream habitats, and we found differences in lake and stream aquatic insects in terms of their distribution, morphology, phoretic association, and diet, and that really just brings to me, for me, a lot more questions, like how common is this lotic-lentic phenomenon and why is it happening? And what could be some of those advantages for that? Um, say in, in, the, in the Sierra Nevada, as streams are maybe drying earlier, could this serve as a refugia for those stream species to sort of hide out in lakes maybe until, until the weather is up, until the climate's better? 